Um, the toilets, they're back in the main entrance hall where you came in. So if you go out the door here, round to the right hand side, you can follow the signs for this room, but in reverse, and that will take you there. Uh, in case of any emergencies, the fire exit is either here to your left, or if you go out the back door there, and then round to the right and then to the left, and you'll see the entrance there, or the exit there, sorry. Um, while the speakers are speaking, if you could let them just uh, finish their talk, and then at the end we'll have time for dedicated to Q&A, inshallah. Um, and also we'll have a break at half time, and there's refreshments on your respective sides. So to begin, um, we have two really good speakers, mashallah. Um, up here with me at the moment we have Ustad Muhammad Abu Kalam. He's a trustee and public relations officer of the Muslim Safety Forum. He's a senior member of the Islamic Forum of Europe, serving in the media team and representing IFE as one of its media spokespersons. He is a former secretary of Young Muslim Organisation UK and former editor of Reality Magazine and Insight Magazine. He's a contributor to the Between the Lions blog, a presenter on the popular Easy Talk show on Muslim Community Radio, and is regularly invited as a commentator on news programmes and documentaries, including the BBC's My Name is Muhammad. He's a father of two daughters, and he studied politics and international relations at Westminster University. He's also a qualified teacher. But before he takes to the stage, uh, we're going to have some hadith reading from a young man, so, Sakib, could you come and join us? I take pearls. Here are some sayings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu character. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu peace be upon him, said, by his good character, a believer will attain the degree of one who prays during the night and fasts during the day. Abu Dawood Hadith 2,200 A person once asked the Prophet وسلم, what is faith? The Prophet replied, when a good deed becomes a source of pleasure for you and evil deed becomes a source of disgust, then you are a believer. He, he was then asked, what is sin? The prophet said, when something pricks your conscience, give it up. al ti ti mi di hadith 8. Honesty. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, if you guarantee me six things on your part, part, I shall guarantee you paradise. Speak the truth when you talk. Keep a promise when you make it. When you are trusted with someone, with something, fulfill your trust. Avoid sexual immoral a morality, lower your gaze in modesty and restrain your hands from injustice. Al Tirmidhi Hadith 1260. Asalaamu Alaikum. Jazakallah, Hair Brother Sakib. Inshallah, you'll be joining us on the stage and giving the talk in the future, inshallah. Now I'll hand over to our first speaker, so we'll start. Take it away. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma akhlis niyati wa amali. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa arzukni tiba'a. Wa arina al-batila batilan wa arzukni jtinaba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, um, first and foremost, um, Jazakallah Khair to the Hoba Muslim Circle for um, organizing this event. Uh, 24 hours uh, with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And thank you very much for all of you brothers and sisters for taking the time out to be here actually. It's uh, the middle of the week, it's a working day. 
um, early in the uh, evening. So, um, alhamdulillah, it's a nice day outside as well. So you've um, you've sacrificed quite a bit to be here. May Allah subhanahu wa taala reward us all for our intentions, and hopefully we we gain some benefit and some uh, blessings through being in this gathering. Inshallah, any gathering where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned and where you know we're going to be speaking about Allah and and His Prophet and we're going to be mentioning verses from the Quran and blessed. Any gathering where we're, we're mentioning Allah and the Book of Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a blessed gathering uh, where angels descend and they pray for the attendees uh, and you know um, Sakina descends, tranquility descends in these gatherings so we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to accept us inshallah. So um, we're talking about 24 hours with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and um, Brother Junaid uh, will, will be speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu from Dhuhr uh, up until when he goes to sleep after praying Salatul Isha. And um, I've been asked to uh, speak about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he wakes up and um, just before the Dhuhr prayer. That's, the, um, that's my uh, portion of the, of the topic, inshallah. But first and foremost, I think we should, we should speak about why, why are we studying uh, or why are we interested, why are we keen to know about the 24 hours of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is it in our benefit to understand and study uh, and ponder and draw lessons from his life and his 24 hours? Well, firstly, he is the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the seal of all the prophets. Um, so there has been a line of prophets who have come and blessed this earth from the time of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam up until the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the role and responsibility of these messengers and prophets is to guide people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to teach people their religion and is to establish the sharia, the, the way of life for the people. And each prophet did this responsibility and the final prophet who came, who was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After his demise, this earth, this, this world will not be blessed uh, by another prophet. That's it. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is, is the seal, the khatmul anbiya. He's the seal of all the prophets. Meaning, after him, prophethood is no more. There will be no other prophets. So this is one of the reasons why we're studying this topic. It's because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is our link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our guide and he is the one who brought us the sharia. His life is an example for us. And in this regard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَكَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, in the example, in the behavior and conduct of the Messenger of Allah is the best of examples. So if you want to know how to live your life so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with you, if you want to know what things will draw you closer to Allah, what actions and what deeds and what words will rise you in rank in Jannah. If you want to know what things you have to stay away from so that you don't get punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after you die. You have to follow an example, you have to follow a methodology, you have to follow a way which is the best way. And that way is the way of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is another reason why we should really study this subject and, and know this subject well. Because Rasulullah is, our, is the best of examples. Uh, another reason why um, we should study this uh, subject is because um, loving the Prophet of Allah is a condition for perfecting your faith. We are all Muslims. When we say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we attain faith. But that faith has levels and degrees. Some people have high faith, some people have weak faith, and some people have complete and perfect faith. We should all strive to have perfect and complete faith. Our iman should be complete. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith, he taught us how to complete and perfect our faith. He said, none of you will attain the completion of faith or the perfection of faith. None of you will get perfect faith until you love me. Until you love me. So the love of Rasulullah is a condition to your perfection of faith. Without loving the Prophet of Allah, your faith will not be complete. And the, the amount of love you have for the Prophet of Allah is proportionate to the level of completion of your faith. 
So if you don't love Rasulullah very much, this is an indication that your faith or my faith isn't complete. The more I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the more complete my faith is. Now, what is love? You, love is, when you love somebody, you want to do something and you want to do things for that person that you love so that they are happy. You want to follow them, you want to please them, you want to emulate them. If you love somebody, you want to be like them. So if you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly, then you want to be like him. You'll want to please him. You'll want to follow his, his words and his deeds, his behaviors and his mannerisms. So this is another reason why we study this subject, in order to attain the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, and the final, there are many other reasons why we study this subject, but the final reason is um, there is a, a verse in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ Say, if you uh, truly love Allah, then follow me. Allah is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah is saying, O Muhammad, tell the people, tell mankind, tell the believers, tell the Muslims, if you believers love Allah, then follow the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah will love you. So this verse is quite amazing because what we learn here is to love, to, uh, for Allah to love you, in order for Allah to love you, you have to love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in order for you to attain the love of Allah, you have to love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So again, how can you love Rasulullah if you don't know him, if you don't, if you don't know what he, how he was, what he looked like, how he behaved, how he lived his life? When you start knowing and implementing these uh, sunnas of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these examples, then you will attain the love of Allah and you will attain uh, Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also love you. You will love Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. So um, this is why we're studying this subject. And there are a couple of words uh, that we need to know. A couple of, um, uh, so sunnah, the word, the, the word sunnah is going to be mentioned often. Uh, what does it mean? And the word hadith. What, what does it mean and what are the, what are the difference? Uh, sunnah is defined differently by different scholars. The, the, the scholars of hadith define it differently to the scholars of fiqh and to the scholars of usul al-fiqh. But to keep it simple, uh, sunnah means literally in the Arabic language it means like a path or a road or a way. So a road or a path or a way is called uh, the, a sunnah. But in Islamic um, usul, in usul al-fiqh it means all the things that have been reported from the Prophet in terms of what he said, what he did, and what he approved of. So the sunnah is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Like for example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Verily, every deed is judged by its intentions. So this is a sunnah of the Prophet by word, by word in terms of what he said. And then there's sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of what he did. So for example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would give uh, salam. He would um, you know, um, leave the house with his um, uh, left, uh, left foot. Uh, these, these kind of things. These are the sunnah of Rasulullah in terms of what he did. And then the final sunnah is um, what he approved of. So for example, um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his sahaba, Do not pray your asr until you reach Bani Khuraidah which is uh, you know, the ta uh, the, the, a tribe of the Jews. Rasulullah was saying, don't pray your asr until you reach that city, that town. Yeah? And the, the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, there was two groups of them in terms of their understanding. Some of them understood these words of Rasulullah, do not pray your asr until you reach Bani Khuraida to mean you don't, they took it literally. And so they went to Bani Khuraida and then they prayed asr. And the others, the other group, they interpret it to mean what Rasulullah is actually saying is that he wants us to hurry up and get to Bani Khuraida. Because Asr time is short, therefore we need to move quickly in order to get to Bani Khuraida to pray Asr. So they understood it to mean um, go there quickly. So when, when the two groups arrived in Bani Khuraida, Rasulullah approved both actions. The action of those who prayed in Bani Khuraida and those who actually prayed their Asr and then went quickly to Bani Khuraida. So that's an approval of the Prophet because he didn't say, no, you guys were wrong. 
He didn't say actually you did wrong or this, this group of Sahaba were right. He approved both actions. Another an example of an approval is um, some of the Sahaba, they used to eat lizard. They used to eat lizard. Rasulullah didn't eat lizard. But he never said anything against those Sahaba who ate lizard. So this is what the Sunnah is. Now the Hadith are the narrations. This is the difference between Sunnah and Hadith. Hadith are the narrations. They're the reports of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a sahaba would hear or would see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do something and then they would report it to somebody else. They would report it to their students and then it would be recorded in the books of hadith. You know, so that's the difference between sunnah and hadith. Just for, um, uh, you know, just for an overview of the subject. So let's start with, with, with the, 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 the beginning of the day of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The day of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would begin at tahajjud. Many of our days begin with the alarm clock ringing and a, and a rush to get our clothes on and get ready and then dash to work. Many of our days begin after fajr time has elapsed. And we do our fajr late or, or we rushing to get to the mosque and at fajr and it's, it's all a rush and a panic. Our days begin in a rush and a panic. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's day literally begins in the last third of the night. The night is divided into three and he would wake up at the, in the last third of the night. A good time before Salatul Fajr, a good time before Fajr even starts. That's when Rasulullah's day would, would commence and he would, uh, start, he would wake up to pray the Tahajjud prayer. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray this prayer because it was a very uh, rewarding, blessed, virtuous prayer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and some part of the night wake up for prayer, uh, which is an additional command for you, O Muhammad. So that, so that your Lord may raise you to a high platform. So this verse which is found in Surah Al-Isra, verse 79, is commanding the Prophet to wake up for some part of the night. And this waking up and praying in some part of the night is an additional obligation for the Prophet ﷺ. In order for him to reach a high platform, Maqam al-Mahmuda, the high platform, the platform for the, the praised ones. Um, so tahajjud prayer for the Prophet ﷺ was a wajib. It was almost an obligation. And for the Muslims, for the ummah, it's a sunnah. It's a recommendation. Um, Rasulullah ﷺ would pray tahajjud, would stand at night praying tahajjud for so long, reciting slowly and beautifully, and reciting, um, repeating many verses which talk about Jannah and Jahannam, which warn people about the resurrection. He would recite long, long surahs until his feet begin, began to swell because he was standing for such long periods. He gave so much emphasis for this prayer. It was his, the first prayer of his day. And he gave it a lot of emphasis. And there is a reason why he gave it a lot of emphasis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, we will cast upon you heavy words. Um, this is in Surah Al-Muzammil. The beginning of Surah Al-Muzammil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who are wrapped up in your garments, arise and pray at night for a little bit, maybe half of it or less than half of it, and recite the Qur'an with beautiful, slow, measured recitation. Perhaps your Lord will cast a heavy word on your shoulders. So this is the reason why Rasulullah used to pray tahajjud. The reason he used to pray tahajjud is because tahajjud prayer, waking up at night uh, when everybody else is asleep, on your own, just in the presence of your Lord, in, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting slowly, reciting with, um, with a nice melodious tone, reciting verses which remind you of Allah, which, which remind you of judgment day. This will prepare you for the burden of da'wah. The heavy word that is mentioned in this surah, in surah Al-Muzammil, is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All people who are serious about being Muslims, all people who are serious about conveying the message of Islam to their neighbors and to the non-Muslims and, and changing society from a society which is misguided and immoral to a pious, righteous society, they need spiritual strength. They need energy. And the energy, the, one of the main ways of getting that energy is through tahajjud. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged the Muslims to pray tahajjud as a sunnah, although for him it was a wajib. When he arrived in Medina, one of the first things that he said when he arrived in Medina, these are uh, you know, the, the new Muslims of Medina, 
they've all come out to greet him and they're all happy to meet him and you know the, the, it's an exciting uh, happy atmosphere what does rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say the first words that he says in addressing the people of medina he says o oh people spread the salam meaning spread peace amongst yourselves give salam to each other the people that you know the people that you don't know the young and the old don't you know withhold your tongue from giving salam so he said oh people spread salam feed the people keep uh, your your relationships you know your your kingships keep them and pray during the night and pray during the night so this was one of the first um, instructions that he gave to the people of medina pray during the night when others are asleep and if you can do this you will enter paradise in peace spread the peace feed the people keep the ties of kinship pray at night if you can do these things you'll enter jannah in peace so that's the that's the uh, formula that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave so tahajjud was very important and rasulullah would do this very he wouldn't miss tahajjud uh, how 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 often have we prayed tahajjud do we do we make it a habit to pray tahajjud some of us Alhamdulillah, during maybe Ramadan, we get to pray a bit of tahajjud because tarawih is late and then, you know, we have to wake up for suhoor and therefore we get to do tahajjud. But apart from outside of Ramadan, do we take tahajjud <coughs> seriously? We should try to the best of our abilities to implement this in our lives because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do this. When he woke up, Rasulullah would um, rub his eyes. Um, when he woke up, he'd rub his eyes so that he was awake and then immediately he would make a dua. So having woken up, just before he actually prays tahajjud, he rubs his eyes and he makes a dua. He says, um, uh, he, ma he, makes a, he, he makes a dua. Alhamdulillah, amatana wa ilayhi nushur. All praise is due to Allah who has given us life after he gave us death. And to him is our return. So the first thing that he says is a, is a dua, is a supplication. And this is a, a characteristic of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that the dua is a dua mukhul ibadah. Supplication is the is the main aspect of worship. Worship is supplication. That's what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to us. And when he woke up, the first thing he did was he made dua. Why is this? Because he knows who he is. Rasulullah knows his position. Rasulullah knows exactly who he is in respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Rasulullah in respect to Allah? He is a slave. He is a servant. He is a, a humble, lowly person. He is not arrogant. He doesn't think he owns the world. He doesn't think he, he owes, people owe him respect. You know, that people should be scared of him or people should, um, you know, respect him. No, nothing like this. He knows that he is a servant of Allah. He is an abd. And this is his main characteristic. This is how he lived his life. Humble servant of God. He was far, far away from arrogance. That's why he acknowledged straight away when he woke up that Allah woke him up. He, the alarm didn't wake him up. Um, anxiety for work and for his children or whatever. Or to watch the football that day or to go and meet his friends. That, no, nothing like that woke him up. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who woke him up from sleep. And if he didn't wake up from sleep, he would have died. He would have been dead. And Allah is the, is the one who gives life and he gives death. So straight away, the first thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa does is make a dua. And his whole dua is about, uh, you know, servitude and being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the tahajjud prayers is units of two. When, if, if we pray tahajjud, we should do it in two raqat and they should be up to eight raqat. If you pray tahajjud regularly, then you shouldn't pray your witr after your isha. The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that he would always pray tahajjud. Therefore, after isha, he wouldn't do his witr salah. He would go to sleep, he'd rest a little bit, and then when he wakes up, prays his tahajjud, he would make his witr the last prayer of of the night. Tahajjud should be uh, the witr should be your last prayer. So after you've completed your tahajjud, you do your witr of of three rakat. And so after uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, would do this, he would then go to do um, Fajr. But before all of this, he has to make wudu, right? He has to make wudu. Uh, and, and the way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make wudu is, is first of all, he would say, uh, Bismillah. And he would have intention to make wudu. And then I'm not going to go through how to make wudu because you guys uh, know all of this. 
Um, so it, there's no point in, in, in going through, through it. But let's remind ourselves of some, some hadith about uh, making wudu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, When the Muslim performs wudu and washes his face, Every sin that he has looked at with his eyes will fall from his face with the water or with the last drop of the water. When he washes his hands, every sin that his hands have committed will fall from his hands with the water or with the last drop of the water. When he washes his feet, every sin with which he walked towards, every sin with which he engaged in, uh, which he walked to, will fall from his feet with the la drop of the last water. Uh, until he ends up being sinless. This is the power of wudu, you see. Wudu is a preparation to meet your Lord. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the salah is the key to Jannah. The salah, the prayer is the key to Jannah. But what is the key to your prayer? Your, the key to your prayer is purity. And the way that you purify yourself is through wudu or through a ghusl. So we need to look at wudu differently. We need to look at wudu as an act of worship. Not as something that you rush to do before the prayer and then as soon as you've prayed you lose your wudu. No, that's not what we, how we look at it. We need to look at wudu as a gate to the key of Jannah. It's the key to the key of Jannah. If salah is the key to Jannah, wudu is the key to the key. Do you understand? So we need to look at wudu differently. We need to think about wudu completely differently. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, another thing that he used to do quite free, uh, regularly is to use the miswak. You know, the, the tooth stick. He used to have a stick uh, which, would, which had bristles at the end of it. He would chew it in order to make it soft. And then he would uh, brush his teeth with the miswak. And there's a lot of reward uh, for this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith which is related by our, our mother Aisha. She said that, Rasulullah reported, said to her that the miswak or the siwak cleans the mouth and pleases the Lord. It cleans the mouth and pleases the Lord. It's a sunnah to use the miswak. But you need to brush your teeth and you need to have good oral hygiene. Uh, you need to use the brush and the toothpaste to do that. That is the function of toothpaste and brush. Right? I know this is very basic and elementary but... Muslims have to smell good. Muslims have to be clean and hygienic. That is so important. One of the things that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to say to his sahaba is, don't come to the prayer having eaten onion, garlic, or the meat of camel. Why? Because the meat of camel used to have an odor. Onions has an odor. Garlic has an odor. So we learn that the spirit of the sunnah is, when you go to a congregation, when you go to a jama'ah where there are other people, don't go there smelling, don't go there sweating, don't go there looking rough and, 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 and rugged. Go there looking good, smelling good, having a good odor about yourself. This is the lesson that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving us through the use of the miswak. Now we should use the miswak in order to show our love for the Prophet. Because he used it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't brush our teeth. There are some people who use the miswak but they don't brush their teeth, they don't use oral hygiene and although they got the miswak, you wouldn't want to talk to them if you, or if you did talk to them, you'd probably look the other way as they're speaking because they're heavy on the miswak but very light on cleaning their teeth and using uh, a good uh, toothpaste so don't confuse, yourself, confuse the sunnah uh, with the spirit of the sunnah as well the sunnah is to use the miswak but the spirit of the sunnah is to keep clean, to smell good, to look good in your appearance. And this is what we should be striving for as well. Uh, there's another hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha says that Rasulullah sallallahu whenever he went to sleep, whether it was at night or during the day, and he woke up, he, was brush, he would brush his teeth with the miswak. Again, giving you the, uh, a clear understanding of how keen Rasulullah was about hygiene. And there's, there's, there's a hadith which um, is recorded in Imam al-Bazzar's collection. Uh, and again, it's reported by Aisha where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that the prayer with the miswak in terms of virtue is 70 rakat more than the prayer without the miswak. A prayer that you do having brushed your teeth with miswak, you get 70 times more reward for that prayer 
than a prayer that you pray without brushing your teeth with miswak. So it's, it's a good sunnah to try and implement in your life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would sometimes awake his family to pray tahajjud, so his wife. Uh, he would wake them up sometimes. And sometimes he would let them sleep because the tahajjud is a sunnah for them, his family, but it's not a sunnah for him, it's a, it's a wajib for him. So sometimes he'd wake them up, sometimes he'd let them sleep. But for Fajr, he would always wake them up. He wouldn't let his family sleep and he go and pray and earn the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wouldn't do that. He would wake his family up, but he'd do it gently. You know, he'd do it gently. He wouldn't go and, 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 and drop a bucket of water on them or shout, hey, are you not going to wake up? And he wouldn't. He, no, Rasulullah was characterized by gentility. He was a gentle person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, We have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a rahmah to the whole world. Rasulullah was a mercy. He was merciful. He wasn't aggressive. He wasn't, uh, you know, forceful. He wasn't angry. He wasn't characterized by being always angry and up for it, you know, up for a fight up for a conflict. No, he was a peacemaker. He was the one who spread salam. He was the one who was rahmatul lil alameen. He was a mercy and he was the one who was characterized by hilm, by forbearance and by gentility. He was a gentle person. And so he would wake his family gently. Aisha radiallahu anha uh, uh, had a conversation with the Prophet of Allah and um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, O oh Aisha, did you know that Allah is gentle and he loves gentleness and he rewards for gentleness what is not granted for harshness and he does not reward anything else like he rewards gentleness. So anything that you do, if you do it with gentleness and if you avoid harshness, then you get the reward for it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't reward anything else. The reward for gentility is so great and so high that it isn't equaled by anything else. So he would wake his family with gentility. And then obviously, sometimes Rasulullah would go and pray the Fajr prayer in the clothes that he went to sleep in. And sometimes he would change. So he would do both. Um, and so he would put his clothes on uh, in order to go and pray uh, Fajr in the masjid. And he would always commence with his right hand. Whenever he wore, it, wore an item of clothing, he would start with uh, putting on the right hand and he would start with putting on the left, right, uh, right feet as well. Anything good that he did, anything positive that he did, he would do with his right hand. You know, the people of paradise are, are on the right and the people of um, hell are on the left. But for the Dajjal, it's the opposite way. The people of um, hell are on the right and the people of paradise are on the left for the Dajjal. When he comes, he will have like a, two streams or two uh, streams flowing across. And that's the opposite. For the Muslims, the right hand signifies goodness, blessing and barakah. And that's why he would start with his right hand. He would shake his hands. He would shake people's hands with the right. He would eat with the right. All good things he'd do with the right. And some, anything that involved uh, clean, cleaning yourself or uh, touching dirt or something, he would do with his left hand. So he'd start with his right and when he, um, when he wore his clothes, he would again make a dua. He would say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi kasani hadha wa razaqani min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwwatin. So he would make this dua. Uh, and this dua, the meaning of this dua is, all praise is for Allah. All praise and thanks is due to Allah who has clothed me with this garment and he has provided it for me with no power or might for myself. Again, what is Rasulullah doing? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is acknowledging that he has nothing without the help and assistance of Allah. The clothing that he is wearing. You know, sometimes when we're speaking to the brothers or when we're speaking to our family, we say, oh yes, I went and bought this and I went and bought that and I'm going to go to the shop and I'm going to buy this. But we forget that we are just helpless without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything that we do, we have to remember Allah. We have to bring, bring to our mind and to our attention that if it wasn't for the blessings of Allah, we wouldn't have this clothing. If it wasn't for... There are people in Syria, I was reading uh, Ajmal Masrur's blog. Brother Ajmal Masrur has gone to Syria. If you follow him on Facebook or Twitter, read his blog. Uh, he went to this house 
He went to Syria and he went to visit this family. And this family was a family of doctors and um, rich people. They, uh, they had a lot of wealth. And then Bashar al-Assad um, attacked their home and bombed it. So they had to flee. They had to flee their home. And what did they flee with? They, f they were able to run away from their home with the only things that they had on themselves. So the only clothing that these people had was the clothing that they were wearing. When they went back to their building, they saw that part of their building was destroyed by the bombings, but part of the building wasn't. And their house was, alhamdulillah, not bombed down. So they decided to go to their home and get some clothing at least. Because the only possession that they have is the clothing that they're wearing. So when they entered their home, they saw that the thugs of Bashar al-Assad had stolen the whole, uh, you know, all the clothing, all the food, all the, uh, you know, utensils, all the, you know, the fridge, the TV, everything in that house was ransacked and they had nothing. So we don't know how fortune will, will turn on us. Today we've been blessed to have a cupboard full, a wardrobe full of clothing. Tomorrow we don't know what is going to happen to us. So when we are in any situation, we have to acknowledge that we're in this situation because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thanked Allah uh, for the clothing that he had and he acknowledged his weakness and his inability and the, and the fact that he was simply a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the clothing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's clothing was simple. It was practical and it was whatever was available to him at the time. He didn't have a tailor that made intricate uh, items of clothing and designs and, and you know, add a, uh, you know, a sleeve here and put embroidery there. And that wasn't what Rasulullah was about. He would wear whatever was available to him. And when some people gifted him nice items, embroidered items and, 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 and fancy items, he would accept the gift and he would wear it. As long as it fit, it wasn't tight fitting, as long as it was loose. You see, Muslim men have, um, uh, uh, you know, hijab as well. Sisters have hijab, they wear their lo loose clothing and, you know, alhamdulillah, they cover their hair and, and that's their hijab. But the brothers, you too have hijab. Some of our brothers, mashallah, they wear t-shirts that are three sizes below their size. They probably borrow t-shirts from their younger brothers and they put it on and you see their biceps and, and you see their triceps and all the rest of it. This is not from the sunnah. This is not what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to do. We should wear items of clothing that are loose, that do not show our figure, that do not show our bulges. You know, we have to be humble in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unless of course you're in jihad. Unless of course you're in jihad. In jihad, there was a sahaba radiallahu anhu. During the time of Omar, he was five minutes. He was, um, uh, the Sahaba uh, was, a, was a hench man, right? He was <coughs> tough and he was wearing armor and they, they were fighting the Romans at the time and they had sieged the, the, the Romans for a long time and the Romans had resisted for quite well. And then uh, the Muslims were, uh, you know, were gaining uh, the ground and they had did this um, ploy, this trick which exposed the leader of the enemies, the Romans, and there were there were you know there were a few Muslims and a few of the leaders of the uh, of the Romans. So what this Sahaba he said to Omar radiallahu anhu is, "O oh, Amirul Mu'minin, O oh, Khalifa of Allah, oh, you know Khalifa, allow me to take off my top." Allow me to take off my top so that the kuffar can see me and wallahi they will be scared. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa um, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, um, okay, I allow you to. And so what happened was he took off his top and he lay onto the ground. And then when, when it was at night time, and then when the fajr came and the, and the sun rose, he stood up. And he looked like a mountain with his chest bared and they saw his muscles and his, and his strength. And they laid down their arms and they gave up to the Muslims and the Muslims, mashallah, con conquered that land and defeated the Romans. So, you know, you have to do things at its appropriate time and place. Uh, but generally Muslim, sh Muslim men should wear loose items of clothing as well and they shouldn't wear very tight fitted jeans or tight fitted tops. Obviously this is, this is, not to be, obviously this is also applicable to our sisters. Um, 
Um, uh, so, um, although Rasulullah, we said although Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wore simple items of clothing, he did not compromise on looking handsome and looking well-groomed and looking uh, beautiful, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah was the most beautiful man, he smelled good, and they said that when, when you would shake the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if a sahaba shook the hands of the Prophet, other sahaba knew that he had met the Prophet for three days. Even after day three, the, the scent of Rasulullah was apparent in the hands of that Sahaba who shook, him three, who shook his hands three days ago. And another Sahaba, once Rasulullah was talking about arrogance, and he was saying, you know, a person who has a mustard seed of arrogance will not even smell Jannah, let alone enter Jannah. And so the Sahaba said, oh Rasulullah, what about wearing nice clothing and having shiny shoes? Does that mean arrogance? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, that is not arrogance. Arrogance is when you despise the truth and when you belittle other people. So when you, when you dress, you should dress beautifully, you should look smart, look clean, look good, but don't belittle other people and don't deny the truth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa preferred wearing white, he wore most colors, he didn't wear absolutely red color. Something that's exclusively red. For women, red is allowed. For men, just red on its own isn't allowed. If it's mixed with other colors, the scholars say it's allowed. He used to wear a, a ring. Rasulullah used to wear sandals. He used to wear a cap and a turban. We mentioned uh, that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he ever, he, you know, he used to emphasize good hygiene. Uh, this also included attending the, the, the call to nature. When he would go, uh, to, uh, to attend to the call of nature before he would go into the toilet he would make a dua Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wal khaba'ith I seek refuge in Allah from the filth and uh, the, the, the female uh, filthy devil and the male filthy devil yeah he would seek refuge from Allah from, from the devil he'd enter the toilet with his left foot anything bad anything uh, to do with waste or dirt left hand or left foot so he'd enter uh, with his left foot he would not expose himself. Even when he went to the toilet, he didn't have his thing completely. He would only expose himself to the limit that needed to be exposed and necessary for him to relieve himself. He would do istinja with um, three items and sometimes he would use water. Uh, three items meaning three clay or, or muddy, muddy uh, items to clean himself. Uh, we used um, toilet paper, but he would also use water on occasion as well. Uh, that, that's not a problem. He wouldn't face uh, the qibla to, do, um, uh, to, to attend to his toiletry needs. And when he finished, he, would come, he wouldn't speak in the toilet. He wouldn't read. Some people take the paper and they get to read the sports page up until the front page in the toilet. This is against the sunnah. He wouldn't read or talk in the toilet. And when he, when he would leave, uh, he would say, Gufranaka, meaning Allah forgive me. And then he, he would leave. He would comb his hair, he would put oil on his hair, um, and um, he would um, have, you know, he would trim his nails. I'm just going to quickly run through this because Brother Junaid is going to start on at Dhuhr, yeah? So let me quickly finish this. He would clip his nails frequently, every 15 days. He would like to clip his nails on a Friday. He would um, make sure that he was. Uh, trimmed and clean in terms of his, um, you know, personal uh, hygiene as well. So he would do that monthly. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would do his ghusl with intention to, to, to purify himself. He would start wash, by wash, saying Bismillah, washing his hands uh, and then cleaning his private parts with his left hand. His ghusl would be his private parts with his left hand and then he would wash the rest of his body and then he would do wudu as you do wudu and then he would move aside and then wash his feet so that he wasn't stepping on any of the dirty water. And all of this he did because he was always in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make wudu um, and, and, and he said that uh, we, we mentioned to you already about the, the blessings of wudu and Whilst he was making wudu, he wouldn't be extravagant with water. Once a sahaba was using water and he was spilling a lot of water, and he said, um, do you be extravagant whilst making wudu? Oh, Sa'ad, the sahaba was Sa'ad. And, and, and Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, he said, can there be extravagance once you're, when you're cleaning yourself for preparing for, for prayer, Ya Rasulullah? Can there be extravagance in making wudu? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, even if you were at the bank of a river, 
and you had unlimited supply of water, do not be extravagant and do not be wasteful. So this is our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would, after Salatul Fajr, he would sit and do adhkar and dhikr of Allah and, and do the tasbih of Allah and he would wait until the Salatul Duha and whilst he was waiting he would meet his Sahaba he would speak to them some of them would ask him about uh, questions that they had in terms of their religion he would answer them some of them would want advice he would give them advice some of them would want to just sit and talk and, and have a joke and a, and a laugh with him and he would do that as well he was a very very uh, he, was a, he was the best of creation Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after that he would then go home and spend some time with his family he would go home and he would ask is there any food if there wasn't any food in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would make intention he would fast that day some days he would go home and he wouldn't ask about food if his wife served him he'd eat if she didn't serve him he would fast imagine this brothers if your wife doesn't serve you breakfast one morning how do you turn this is not from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha reports on some occasions there would be three months that would go by without a fire being lit in the kitchen of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So three months without him eating, and whenever he did have food, he would share it. His sunnah is if there's food for one, two people can eat. If there's food for two, three people can eat. If there's food for three, five people can eat. He would always eat. In, in a big company, he would eat from immediately in front of him. He would eat with three hands, his thumb, his index and his middle finger. And he would never ever eat to his full. He would never eat to his full. He said that the minimum is uh, three quarters, one third, excuse me. One third should be for food. One third should be for food. But he would not eat that much. He would always eat less, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So before Dhuhr, at midday, he would go for a bit of a sleep, a bit of a nap. Uh, he would sleep and then when he woke up he would go for the Dhuhr prayer and inshallah brother Junaid will carry on from there inshallah sorry I took a bit extra Jazakallah for that no worries about overrunning alhamdulillah it was a very good speech mashallah and uh, Jazakallah for joining us before we break um, just a couple of announcements obviously a little bit about uh, Holy Muslim circles who have uh, organised this event this evening um, we run regular activities in the area. Uh, on a Friday we do a, a circle for the, uh, the, the Holborn Mosque uh, near Chancery Lane Station, and that's for the brothers. And coming up soon we're hoping to start as part of that circle, looking at, obviously this evening we looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to look at the other uh, the Prophets, uh, Noah Alayhi Salaam for example. And also after that we're going to look at the, the Ten Sahaba uh, Promised Paradise. And inshallah we'll record that so everyone can view it as well for those who can't make it. And obviously um, events such as this in the future inshallah. And if you'd ever like to get involved with us, help us out, there are um, forms available at the refreshment tables for you. Um, and also we are in fact actually being filmed this evening for a, a, a documentary on uh, Islam Today. Um, and that's by the Sahar channel. Um, obviously if you need to pray us so you can do at the break. And also, um, after the second speaker, we may run a little bit into Maghrib time, but inshallah that'll be okay and there'll still be time for Salah, inshallah. So if you could come back um, at 10 to 8, um, English time, not Asian time, please, inshallah, and uh, see you then. <laughs>